Good morning and welcome to our service for Grange uh, for, for the South Lake Circuit from Grange Methodist Manse. Um, sorry if there's a little bit of a delay there between uh, the music beforehand ending. Um, if you saw the question in the comments uh, on the uh, on Facebook, we've been trying to construct another verse for our first song, and we thought we'd try and get it done, and then suddenly the time was gone. We think we've got one. I haven't typed it in yet though. I haven't typed it in yet, um, but welcome. It's good to join together. And um, just as we, uh, um, before we uh, sort of start properly, um, just to say that next week is the start of Advent. Believe it or not, here we are on the countdown to Christmas, but then of course everyone's talking about Christmas, aren't they? So Advent begins next week. And uh, normally in church, we'd be lighting Advent candles. And so we've been trying to think a little bit about what we do with that in our um, current circumstances of joining together online. And uh, if you would like to, um, feel free to find some candles. They don't need to be special candles. They don't need to be red and white or purple and pink and white or whatever you feel the um, appropriate colors are, but just some ordinary candles will be fine. If you've only got one, that's fine too. You can just light that candle. Um, but if you have five, you can progressively light them um, more each week as we will do here. Um, so. Uh, just if you want to be ready for next week. Um, Paul's typing furiously, <laughs> so I need to pad. I, I'm so glad I'm not a presenter on the, on TV and having to having to do with this uh, all the time because I don't know what to pad with really. Uh, we're going to continue our um, uh, theme from last week of thinking about uh, about worship and whether. 
Um, the fact that we can't meet in our church buildings during this second lockdown is actually preventing us from worshipping. Um, last week we were looking at Old Testament sacrifice as the sort of the heart of gathered worship for the Israelites from when they emerged from Egypt and they later settled down and built the temple in Jerusalem. So we're continuing that theme as we, um, as we go into this week. Oh, I've given them, Paul's given me a thumbs up, so that's good. I can stop rambling. <laughs> um, our first song this morning that we're going to sing is God Behind, God Beside, God Ahead, which reminds us that uh, whatever's going on and wherever we are, even in the really ordinary stuff of life, God is with us, God is all around us and accompany us on this journey through life. Um, so there are normally two verses to this. Um, but we've invented a kind of a middle verse based on suggestions that people have given. Um, and uh, Paul's now moved the words that I wrote down. Can I have those words back? Yes. I find it really hard to look at my thing with music or chords on and look at the screen for the words as well. So um, our normal verse goes when I wake up in the morning in my bed, God behind, God beside, God ahead. Um, I'm not sure we've got rhyming in quite the same no. way <laughs> but we have using your suggestions when we're all online together in our homes god behind god beside god ahead when we're exploring nature all around god behind god beside god ahead when friends are kind and helpful day by day god behind god beside god ahead and when we're on zoom for meetings through the day god behind god beside god ahead so uh, we will add that in in the middle so let's uh, let's just pray um, as we begin loving god we thank you that you are always with us and as we meet together online whether we're meeting in real time whether we're joining in this service uh, later on in the week we pray that we will be um, aware of your presence reassured that you are journeying with us through life amen amen, amen. Right, we're going to sing, and it's got a, a bit on the beginning where we go do 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 something like that. Anyway, <laughs> ready?
So Martha and I are going to lead our prayers together this morning and they're taken from one of the We Worship books uh, from the Iona community. So let us pray. Look for the Lord while God is present. Call out to God who is close at hand. Let us pray. Glorious God, your thoughts are not our thoughts, nor are your ways our ways. You look at the ugliest soul and see, still unstirred, the wings of an angel. We scan the finest of our neighbours, anxious to find the flaws. You see our lives in the context of eternity and make a time for waiting for yearning, for putting all things in proportion. We demand instant results and look for tomorrow before savouring today. You know that only one who suffers can ultimately save, so you choose to walk the way of the cross. We feel judged and threatened by that love which risks all for all. Your thoughts are not our thoughts, nor are your ways our ways. Not to have our worst confirmed, but to have our best liberated, we pray for your grace and your pardon. Forgive us in what has gone wrong. Repair in us what is wasted. Reveal in us what is good. And nourish us with better food than we could ever purchase. Your word, your love, your interest, your daily bread for our life's journey in the company of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. 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 So as I said at the beginning, we're continuing our theme from last week, um, following looking at, at that uh, system of, of worship and sacrifice in the temple. Uh, and we saw that last week, even or early on in the history of the nation, the sort of technical language, and if you, if you look into the Greek, if, if that was something you wanted to do, the technical language that's used to describe those sacrifices begins to be used to talk about prayer and words of praise and confession of faith all may be spoken or sung. And those are all things that uh, we do when we gather together in our church buildings. And it's quite easy, therefore, to, to describe them as worship, as perhaps a replacement for those sacrifices in the temple. Maybe an improvement, we would perhaps think, to uh, sacrificing animals. And those are all things that we're missing being able to do together in church. But it didn't stop there. It's not just prayer and words of praise and confession, um, uh, confessing our faith that uh, become described as sacrifices. The language of the sacrificial system is also used to speak about acts of service, doing good, sharing, uh, financial giving, and, um, and particularly, recognizing that whenever we do these things for others we are in fact doing them for God so these things are worship too they are sacrifices to God even when we're doing them for others and that really starts to take worship out of the building out of the special temple or church 
Uh, the other thing that we touched on a little bit last week, which could become a whole sermon series, is seeing Jesus' death as a sacrifice. We could look at the detail of the Old, uh, Old Testament system. Um, there's usually several different types of sacrifice offered one after another, an offering for sin, and then a whole burnt offering, um, often with a, a drink offering poured out on it. And then it would finish with a fellowship offering or a thank offering, which is really celebrating. So it's, it's almost like the offering for sin is, is dealing with what we've done wrong. And then the whole burnt offering is giving ourselves. And then the fellowship offering or the thank offering is celebrating communion between God and people. And elsewhere in the Bible, Jesus' death is described as the final sin offering given once for all, so that there's no more need to make any sin offerings again. But we're still called to worship God with our thank offerings and fellowship offerings. Our first reading is from Paul's letter to the Philippians. It's, um, the, the first part of it's probably fairly familiar. It's used quite often in church, although we're using a different version. Um, uh, it's going to be read from Tom Wright's uh, translation. But the second part of it, we usually stop before we get to the second part. And if we do read the second part, it's usually read separately. Um, and, and that misses the connections between what's been said. It's one of those places where Paul says, therefore, and you have to look at what the connections are. And really, it's best if you read the whole letter in one go. Um, but we'll just read this uh, slightly long um, section. It's a letter written from prison which perhaps that might speak to us in our lockdown circumstances, because Paul was certainly locked down in writing this. And yet it's full of hope and faith. And just listen out for the sacrificial language at the end. It speaks about being pure and spotless, um, because the temple sacrifices had to be perfect animals without any blemishes. And so that thinking is carried over. So um, uh, thank you to, to John that's reading this one. Thank you, John, for reading for us. The reading is from Philippians chapter 2, reading verses 1 to 18. So if our shared life in the King brings you any comfort, if love still has the power to make you cheerful, if we really do have a partnership in the spirit, if your hearts are all moved, are at all moved with affection and sympathy, then make my joy complete. Bring your thinking into line with one another. Here's how to do it. Hold on to the same love. Bring your innermost lives into harmony. Fix your minds on the same object. Never act out of selfish ambition or vanity. Instead, regard everybody else as your superior. Look after each other's best interests and not your own. This is how you should think among yourselves, with the mind that you have because you belong to the Messiah. Jesus, who, though in God's form, did not regard his equality with God as something he ought to exploit. Instead, he emptied himself and received the form of a slave, being born in the likeness of humans. And then, having human appearance, he humbled himself and became obedient even to death. Yes, even the death of the cross. And so God has greatly exalted him, and to him in his favour has given the name which is over all names, that now at the name of Jesus every knee within heaven shall bow, on earth too, and under the earth, and every tongue shall confess that Jesus, Messiah, is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So, my dear people, you always did what I said, so please now carry on in the same way, not just as though I was there with you, but much more because I'm not. 
Your task now is to work at bringing about your own salvation. And naturally, you'll be taking this with utter seriousness. After all, God himself is the one who was at work among you, who provides both the will and the energy to enable you to do what pleases him. There must be no grumbling and disputing in anything you do. That way, no, nobody will be able to fault you, and you will be pure and spotless children of God in the middle of a twisted and depraved generation. You are to shine, shine among them like lights in the world, clinging on to the word of life. That's what I will be proud of on the day of the Messiah. It will prove that I didn't run a useless race or work to no purpose. Yes, even if I am to be poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of your faith, I shall celebrate and celebrate jointly with you all. In the same way, you should celebrate, yes, and celebrate with me. This is the word of the Lord. Yes, even if I am to be poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of your faith, I shall celebrate. It's a powerful image of self-giving, of pouring uh, Paul pouring his heart and soul into his ministry. Maybe he has in mind that he's facing death, uh, though it's not actually as explicit as some translations make it, where they talk about pouring blood. It's, it's not actually there in the reading. He talks about, I am poured out like a drink offering. Uh, but all of this draws on Christ's self-giving and ultimately um, Christ's self-giving of his own life. We're going to sing again now. Um, this is a new uh, hymn to familiar words. It's number 359 in Singing the Faith. Lord Christ, we praise your sacrifice.
Now we have another reading from Paul's letters. Um, it's often read, but it's actually very hard to make sense of because almost every Greek word in the original writing um, is full of cultural and religious connections that would have spoken to the original readers, but they don't really have any real equivalent for us in English. And, um, and again, it's, it's all part of a much longer train of thought. Uh, Paul is writing about Gentiles and Jews and how all are included in God's salvation. So Brenda's going to read to us from Romans chapter 11 and just going into verse 12. This reading is from Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 11, beginning at verse 33 and reading through to chapter 12, verse 2. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counsellor? Or who has given a gift to him to receive a gift in return? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. I appeal to you therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewing of your minds so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Thanks be to God. Thank you for that, Brenda. Language grows and changes all of the time. Wherever there's history and experiences and culture that are shared, ideas get borrowed and new connections are made and we end up with a kind of a shorthand language that carries a whole lot of thinking with it. Um, I was trying to think of a few examples and struggling, but uh, um, it's, uh, maybe you can add some in the comments if you can think of any. Um, but one example would be, I guess very few of you are experts in planetary, explo ex I can't even say it, planetary exploration, but probably most of you know what the Goldilocks zone is. Um, perhaps you've come across that, the Goldilocks zone, where a planet is, is not too hot, not too cold, not too far away from the, 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 its, its star or too close, and is just right and could be a place where life could be supported. Um, another one, if I described something as strong and stable, given the last few years of our politics, would you think that I was describing it as strong and stable because I felt I could rely on it? Or do you think I might be saying something else? Um, and then there are all sorts of ways that language gets, uh, gets taken up and we use shorthand that, um, that where we've lost the original meaning, really. Um, a, a much older one, uh, how about when someone says, I'm going to spend a penny. <laughs> they, don't mean, <laughs> they don't mean they're going to spend some money. We all know what they mean. Um, but that original context of, of actually physically spending a penny is... Um, it, it, is, it becomes, it means something else. Well, the same sorts of things happen in the Bible over and over again, but mostly we're not familiar enough with the texts, the, all the different Bible texts, and we're not familiar enough with the culture, especially the culture of the time that perhaps isn't seen in the Bible, um, to pick it all up. Uh, there are one or two things that are really obvious that we can hear. Um, for example, John's Gospel begins with those words, in the beginning, in the beginning was the word. And, and even if we're just vaguely aware of the whole Bible, we can pick up the fact that he's echoing the beginning of Genesis, in the beginning. Uh, and and it, it carries with it all of that meaning of recognising that John here, by using those words to begin with, he is saying something about what he's writing. He's saying about the significance of it. 
he's making that connection and saying this is part of that same story just in those few words um, but all of this is even more of a problem for us to pick up on because we're reading in translation I'm not an expert in biblical languages by a long stretch, but I do love looking at the connections that there are. Uh, the New Testament was written in Greek and the Old Testament was mostly written in Hebrew with a little bit in Aramaic, uh, which is the language actually Aramaic is what Jesus and his friends would have spoken much of the time. But the cosmopolitan language for trading, for speaking between different nations was Greek in much the same way that English often is now. Um, a century and more before Jesus, the Hebrew Bible, what we call the Old Testament, was translated into Greek, um, a version that's called the Septuagint. Um, the early church actually grew faster among the Gentiles, um, and there were far more Greek speakers in the early church than those who could read the original Hebrew. So the Septuagint really was the Bible of the first Christian church at the time when the New Testament was being written and going on beyond that. And, um, and there are some really subtle differences between the Hebrew Bible translated, uh, original and the Septuagint translation. And um, sometimes when New Testament writers quote the Old Testament, they're definitely using the Septuagint. And other times it seems more like they're quoting the Hebrew version. Um, at other times they're not quoting, but you can tell that they've been absolutely immersed in the Septuagint because the language that they, they use is full of the phrasing and vocabulary that comes um, from that translation. But of course the Bible isn't the only cultural source, the only context that they're living in. Here in Romans, in the reading that we've heard, Paul is writing to people who straddle the cultural context of the Septuagint, um, on the one hand in its Greek language, but also Greek philosophical thinking. And some people in that congregation will sort of sit more happily in one camp and some in another. And there's a little bit of tussle and conflict perhaps between those who really look only to the Septuagint and the, and the biblical context and others who are drawing in the Greek philosophical thinking. But all of them hearing would have known those cultural references and Paul is speaking to both when he uses these words. He says, I appeal to you therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds, so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. It's full of sacrificial language here. Now, obviously, the Jews weren't the only ones making sacrifices in those um, times. The Romans made sacrifices to Caesar and the gods, um, but the appeal here to offer bodies, offer your bodies, this is really very culturally Jewish. In most schools of Greek philosophy, uh, they would regard the mind as being the true self, the true essence of who you were. And the physical body really would be a bit of a distraction. Um, definitely, it wouldn't be something that you would think you should offer to a transcendent God. But Jewish thinking doesn't divide between the physical and the mental being. Offering your body meant offering your whole self. And that would have really spoken to those who leant towards the Jewish um, thinking and background. But to offer your body as a living sacrifice, that's a real contradiction. Sacrifices are dead, that's the whole point. But Paul's saying no, as a Christian, your sacrifice is not about death. Even though many of the early Christians did go on to die for their faith, actually the sacrifice that we offer is to, to give our whole self still alive and kicking. Um, Paul says, this is your spiritual act of worship. That's how most English translations put it. But the word translated spiritual 
isn't the normal word that Paul would use when talking about spiritual. It's a word that's only used twice in the whole Greek Bible, in the Septuagint and the New Testament. It's only used twice. And it's a Greek word, logikos, which is where our word logic comes from. Um, and there's a lot of talk and thinking and writing about this amongst academics. And um, probably, um, Paul is picking up usage from Philo, who was a philosopher, who was Jewish, but he was really heavily influenced by Greek ideas. And it probably means rational, not spiritual. Philo often speaks about the logikos spirit, the rational spirit. So maybe our translations shouldn't say spiritual act of worship, but actually rational act of worship. This is your logical way of worshipping God. This is the way of worshipping God that makes sense. Maybe Paul is writing to those who are saying that worship should be nothing to do with the physical and everything to do with higher rational thinking and philosophy. But Paul's contradicting that and saying, no, offering your bodily life is the logical, rational way to worship God. This is what makes sense. I'm sorry, that's all been a bit technical and that's more, there's more in the Greek that we could look at, but I think that's enough for one sermon for today. But just notice how far we've come if we step back a little bit. Um, in the Old Testament, we read about the instructions for offering animals which are killed, perhaps in as a substitute for the worshipper. They die in place of the person bringing them. We move from that idea to a kind of a spiritualized understanding of sacrifice as prayer and praise that we offer to God. And then it kind of moves on a bit further to sacrifice as uh, including physical acts of doing good and caring and sharing. These can be seen as sacrifice too. Um, but kind of incorporating all of that and carrying it on, we now have this idea that actually our sacrifice can be the whole of life, offering ourselves as sacrifice. And I wonder, that almost brings us full circle when you think that the in the Old Testament it, it was sometimes really seen as offering the animal in place of yourself. Here, it comes back to saying, actually, no, we offer ourselves. We don't offer an animal, we offer ourselves. We are that um, sacrifice, except that we're living. It's not death. We don't have to die to come close to God. We can come close to God in our living. I love the message translation of, these, uh, of, of this little section. Um, I'm not a fan of the message in a lot of places, but it says here, so here's what I want you to do. God helping you take your everyday ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work and walking around life and place it as an offering before God. This is not something that we have to do in the temple or in a church. And it's not about certain good deeds that we do. This is everything we are. Everything we are. Um, described in that language of that strange and holy ritual that took place at the heart of the temple where only priests can go. It's no longer about sacrifice, creating a little sacred window into God where we can meet safely with God without fear of being destroyed by God's holiness. No, it's not just a little window. It's about us becoming that place of encounter, our everyday lives, as the altar of God, if you like. This is where God meets us and meets the world in us and through us. We don't need a temple or a church building to worship God. And actually finding ourselves shut out of our church buildings does not mean that we can't worship. Actually, it means we have to discover this thing that Paul is talking about, that our daily life is worship. And, and I think that's really helpful to have to discover that. It's not just, worship is not just doing good deeds. It's actually the most mundane things too. Uh, we can worship God in the way we shop. We can worship God in going for a walk or in staying in. We can worship God by looking after ourselves, by what we eat and by getting enough rest. Actually, we see that in the Ten Commandments, you know, take the Sabbath rest. 
That's worship of God. We can worship God by phoning a friend. All of these things can be done as worship of God. All of them can be ways to encounter God because the whole of us, all our being, all our life belongs to God. Now, I'm not saying we don't need a building, though it is good to challenge ourselves by asking what church would be if we had no building, because, of course, the earliest Christians had no special church building. Our buildings can be a great resource for serving others. They can be a place for doing good and sharing, all of that that we looked at last week, and it is part of what worship is. And I'm also, I'm not saying that we don't need to meet Gathering together to sing, to pray, to share communion, these are all things that I long for and look forward to us being able to do again. And it's useful to have a building to do that in, otherwise you get cold and wet, especially in this part of the world. Our services are really important for our growing in faith. And yes, for being particularly aware of God's presence in that time together and for helping one another to recognise what it is to encounter God in our daily living. Um, for therefore our encouragement and our equipping of our Christian life. But that's not the whole of worship. And I think sometimes as Christians we orientate our lives the wrong way round. We see the day-to-day -day life as the routine and our gathering for worship, as it's often called, as the special thing, the thing that we're working towards, the pinnacle of our Christian lives. When actually, I think we should see it the other way around. The services, when we gather together, are the practice. They're the engine. They're the learning place where we, where we, um, un where we learn to understand what's happening in the rest of our lives. But the day-to-day -day life, that's the real thing. That's the point of it all. And our day-to-day -day lives are the real place for encountering God. We're going to sing another hymn, uh, Beyond These Walls of Worship. Now, this is uh, not a hymn that um, I think we're probably familiar with. Uh, we're going to, um, Martha's going to play through a verse on the viola, and then we will sing. Um, but if you'd rather just listen and take in the words, that's fine too.
So now we come to God in prayer. And if you've got a piece of paper and a pen to hand, then you might want to uh, um, get that now. We're going to think about praying through the week. And I was reminded about the prayer cards that those of us local to Grange um, got uh, just before um, the first lockdown back in, uh, in February, March, these, uh, these prayer diaries. And in there were things to pray, uh, pray for, pray about throughout the week. On one side, things related to our life as a church. But then on the, other on the other hand, things in the wider world. So we're going to use this prayer card. But also, as we go through the days of the week in this prayer card, I'm going to leave a short pause for you to perhaps jot down for each day of the week something that you would like to bring to God in prayer, something perhaps that you normally do on that day of the week, or perhaps a person that you would like to think about on that day of the week, and maybe even this week to phone on that day of the week. So let's pray. So here's what I want you to do. God helping you take your everyday, ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work and walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. Lord God, we thank you for Sunday, for the opportunity that many of us have for rest, for time with our families. And we lay before you this day Today we pray for events in the coming week. We offer our future to you, God. And we pray for the earth. And ask you to guide us as we think about, think about our responsibility to care for your creation. And now we think about tomorrow, Monday. We pray for the children that we know and the parents starting the week of school and work. We pray for the members of Toast Church, for other children in our own church communities. And we pray for the work of the Churches Together Youth Trust in Grange and for our local schools. And in the wider world, we pray for our global leaders in politics, in business, in science and in industry, culture and entertainment. And now we bring Tuesday before you, God. We thank you for those who work in the community food share and food club projects in Grange and further afield. We pray for the volunteers and for those who benefit from those from, from their work. We pray for the reducing of food waste. And in the wider world, we pray for people suffering from hunger, from poverty, from inequality all across the world. And now we bring Wednesday before you, God. We thank you for the coffee mornings that have happened through many years in our church each Wednesday morning. It's sad that at the moment we can't meet, but we thank you for those that have been able to continue to meet on Zoom and for those who are unable to join that 
get that weekly meeting. We pray for them at this time and we pray for the pastoral care that goes on in our church, for those giving and those receiving care, for those caring for others in hospitals and those that are in hospitals, in care homes, and those needing care in their own homes. And in the wider world, we pray for places where there is conflict or division in homes, where there's conflict and division amongst communities, in churches, and in whole nations in the world. And now we think ahead to Thursday and we bring our Thursday to God. We thank you for the many different groups that use our building in normal times, for the rainbows, the brownies, the guides, the baby group. We thank you for those other groups that meet in each other's homes, for church fellowship groups. We thank you for the whole life of our church and our church community. And we pray for our government and voluntary services that support people and communities in need. And now it feels a long way off, but we bring our Friday to you, God. We pray for other church congregations in Grange or in our own areas. We pray for our circuit in the South Lakes. And we pray for all our preachers and ministers and for the work of churches together. And we also pray in the wider world for faith communities across the world, both Christian and those of other faiths. And finally, we think ahead and bring before God next weekend, next Saturday. We pray for those who were part of the well, for families and for relationships, for our own families, for those whose time together is often so short because of distance or busyness, for those thinking about what they might do over Christmas and how they might connect with their families. And we thank you, God, for the good things of the past week and for all those answers to prayers that we have seen. And so as we bring our whole week to God, both the past week and the week to come, let's join together in the prayers that Je prayer that Jesus taught. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And now we're going to sing our final hymn, O Thou Who Camest From Above, which if you've got Singing the Faith is number 564 in Singing the Faith.
So join us next week as we uh, begin that journey of waiting and longing and hoping that is Advent. And uh, uh, I pray and that you may have a, a week in which you sense the presence of God and see the ways that you can worship in all that you do. Amen. And let's share the grace together. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.